Now, before we get started, remember to make your suggestions for the next retro review you would like to see in the comments of this video. It could be an old pay-per-view, it could be an old Raw, SmackDown, Nitro, Thunder, um, it could be a DVD set, it could be a wrestling-related movie, it could be all types of things. And speaking of DVD sets, remember that if you guys buy a total of 15 of these in the month of September, the Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirt, I will have to get the four-disc Jeff Jarrett best of DVD set that TNA put out several years back. Watch all four discs. That's 16 hours of the Memphis Midcard piece of crap, mind you. And then ultimately review it right here on this channel. If you want me to suffer and you want to see that, what surely will be a spectacle, then go to the OTR Central Store at Pro Wrestling Tees and hashtag buy the shirt. We've got four down and 11 more to go. Plenty of time to make it happen, people. Come on now. All right. So anyways, let's move on to the topic at hand. And now, actually, let me back up here really quickly. A lot of you voted for TNA Bound for Glory 2010. 10, 10, 10. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Just know that on October 10th, I will go ahead and review that show because the voting between that and Backlash 2004 was so close. And with Bound for Glory uh, coming up around the corner for Global Force Wrestling, feels like a good time to go back and take a look and review it. So I will review that one. But the winner this time was Backlash 2004. The last review I did of an old show was Backlash 2000. And now here, four years later, you have no more WCW, you have no more ECW, you've got a Raw split, Raw has its own, it's easy for me to say, Raw has its own roster as part of the brand split, SmackDown has its own roster. Um, so there were differences between this show and 2000, and this was not quite the same level of show to me as 2000s was, but... With that said, it's light years ahead of what I would see from most companies in professional wrestling today, well, specifically WWE. The level of talent and depth of the roster here was still outstanding by comparison to what we have now. The stories were better. Um, you might quibble and quabble about whether the in-ring action was better or not, but that could come down to personal taste in terms of what you look for out of actual matches. But I still thought this was a good show and it's funny to go back. I mean, this is 13 years ago, and it gives you an idea of how long ago this was. The match, or the card opened up with Shelton Benjamin versus Ric Flair. That's how long ago this was. Shelton Benjamin versus Ric Flair. And this was at a time where the company was seeming to get really behind Shelton Benjamin. They were really starting to believe in him. I thought maybe there was a chance down the road he might win a Royal Rumble, or he might at least become a world champion at some point in time. Of course, that never happened. But as you watch this match, it was an okay opener. Although as I'm watching it, I just feel this overwhelming sense of frustration and anger, especially now knowing some of the turd Fergusons that have carried, whether it be the Universal Championship or the World Heavyweight Championship or the WWE Championship. And I see that Shelton Benjamin never had it. And it seemed like they were on a collision course with that eventually being a reality. And it just never did. So disappointing. And even at this point in time, when you talk about Ric Flair, Ric Flair was a shell of his former self. I mean, you were basically getting the greatest hits from him in every match and not executed all that properly. Um, honestly, you know, it kind of blended in with the rest of his career. And they just call it as we see it. Um, you saw one of his matches, you pretty much saw all of them. Now, granted, that could fit into different stages of his career, but from 2002 to 2008, most all of his matches were the same, and this one wasn't a whole lot different, honestly. But Shelton Benjamin beat Ric Flair, and it was a good match to open the show. Then you follow that up with Jonathan Coachman taking on Tajiri, and this was about what you would expect it to be. But even then... Tajiri had his own shtick, his own gimmick, his own persona. The coach had more personality, charisma, mic skills than, again, at least 90 to 95% of the current roster that we see today. So the story was there for this match. But again, you were putting the coach in a ring and expecting a match to go off and for it to be any good. It was what it was, and then you just basically move the hell on. The next match was the handicap match, Chris Jericho taking on Christian and Tristratus. My God, 
every time I go back and watch Trish Stratus at this point in time, I just think about how bad I want to motorboat those boobies, how badly I want her to just fucking sit on my fucking face, and how, if I was on the active roster at that time, I would have done everything in my power to make sure that I put as many babies in her as possible. It would have been all about ruining her career at this point in time. That bitch was sexy as fuck. I don't give a shit. And some of these nerds now talking about, oh, he, he, this girl is sexy. Oh, Becky Lynch and Charlotte, they do it for me. Like you look at Trish and then you look at that. I'm just saying, gives me a fucking break. Just saying. But the whole story here, uh, the, the whole bet, <laughs> and I was having flashbacks and laughing to when they replayed the video package before the match, the buildup, talking about the $1 bet, and then Chris Jericho wants to take Trish out, and then they get together, and then ultimately WrestleMania 20, she turns on him, and that's what ultimately leads into this handicap match. Fucking good stuff here. You know, it was, it. was there was a story there. This was Jericho's payback, comeuppance, uh, delivering to Christian after what happened at Mania. You know, me personally, if I was doing this match, you know, like I saw when Chris Jericho put Trish over his knee and spanked her. Now that's a spot you would call if you were any type of self-respecting man. You know, I've been like, the real way to get this story over is let me skinny dip in your pussy. And she would have been like, what the way? Don't question. I'm Chris Jericho. I'm the fucking expert. I know what the story commands. I'm just saying. Angry dragon, that bitch. My goodness. Um, but once we get past all of the raging hormones of me talking about Trish at this stage of his, her career, uh, you know, I would have I would have called more spots. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, Chris. I'm just saying. But good match. Story. Payoff. Gave you what you need for something in the middle of the card. Victoria... Uh, retains her women's championship by defeating Lita. And again, you're looking at Victoria, you're looking at Lita. And, you know, even afterwards when Molly Holly and skinny bitch Gail comes out, I look at Victoria and I look at Molly Holly and I'm like, my Christ, women that used to actually look like women, women that actually had fucking bodies, again, hotter than the vast majority, if not all, of the current roster for my taste. Victoria and Lita was kind of awkward. I don't know that the crowd was into it that much. They probably wanted to be, but it just wasn't really happening. Um, but that's okay, because honestly, the first four matches of the card didn't really matter a whole lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Try to fight this cold. The first match that really mattered was that no-holds-barred uh, IC title match between Randy Orton and Cactus Jack. And... A lot of people probably say there were only two matches that really mattered on this card, and they're probably right. There are only two matches on this card, to which they are also maybe right. I don't know if I fully agree, uh, but this was a money match, and man, did it deliver in a big way. Now, you go back and look at WWE 2004, and you can see an example of what you talk about or what I talk about when I say somebody's being forced. Randy Orton wasn't being pushed. Randy Orton was being forced, and he was being forced down your throat. Like, he was being forced down your throat so bad that they gave him a several-minute-long interview to build up to his match with Foley. Randy Orton, several minutes of mic time, that's a fucking force. And it's crazy to me as I look back and think about how hot this company was for him, and frankly was for about a decade, and how much they were behind him, that it ultimately ended up being Batista that at his hottest was the bigger star out of the group. Funny how that stuff works, but at this point in time, it was all Randy, 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 Randy. And you knew they were building him up for something big very soon, and got there by the time we got to SummerSlam, and he won the World Heavyweight Championship. Um, this match was awesome. This match was everything that it should have been. This story between Mick Foley and Randy Orton was outstanding. It was just another great story in the catalog of great stories in Mick Foley's career. And to this day, to this day, I still think along with his feud with The Undertaker in 2005 that this shit right here might have been Randy Orton's best work. This is when he was young and hungry and a dick and all of that. 
He didn't quite have the backstage political power, but he was getting there. You could tell that he clearly cared. It was all about getting himself to the freaking top. He was working with great people, like in this case, Mick Foley. Man, even when you go back to the WrestleMania match, the three-on-two handicap match with Foley and Flair, or Foley and The Rock versus Flair, Batista, and Randy Orton, this story was awesome. And it worked on so many levels, in part because that's just how good Mick Foley was and how natural of a rival an opponent of Randy Orton was. And at this point in time, even with Orton being the young guy and fans kind of, kind of gravitating towards the new fresh thing, the dynamics of this whole story really worked because you had legitimate reasons to hate Randy, you know, throwing Foley down the steps and all this other crap, beating him at Mania. And Foley was the hardcore legend. Foley was that dude. He still is to this day. Easy dynamics. We like him. We don't like Orton. Let's go out and make a great match. And that's exactly what they did. Orton wins, which isn't all that surprising. That's the way it should have been. But it was one of those things. And as they referenced on commentary, you know, talking about that you saw more out of Orton than you ever had before. And that was absolutely it. And that was exactly the point. And that's what a guy like Mick Foley always did for so many people. There was Triple H. It was The Rock. It was The Undertaker. It was Austin. It didn't matter who it was. He always got something else out of them. He got something new out of them, something more out of them. And that's why he deserves so much respect. And I love going back to this story in 2004 because it was incredible stuff. Uh, Hurricane and Rosie, the superheroes, defeated La Resistance in a match that didn't really matter because this was all about Eugene. And at the time, who would have known, Canadian crowd there in Edmonton, that a few months later, he was going to be working in a semi-main event type of program with Triple H at SummerSlam. You always feel bad for uh, Nick Dinsmore because he, he got into this character. He became that character and an easily, easily a character that you could sympathize with, especially when you had JR in commentary. You know, the way JR sold the Eugene story and sold Eugene the character, it made it really, really hard to hate him unless you were the Toronto crowd at SummerSlam and fuck you because you wanted God to go over. Unbelievable. And speaking of this, even back here at 2004, with JR and Lawler on commentary, JR at the height of his powers, in my opinion, Jerry the King Lawler, incredible work as a heel commentator. Just incredible work. Drooling over the women that he's supposed to, putting over the heels in the way he's supposed to, putting over the faces in a certain way like he's supposed to, while also still trying to put over the heels even more. There was a natural chemistry there between JR and Jerry the King Lawler that we don't get out of anybody's commentary for any fucking wrestling company today. It just that in and of itself made the show so much more enjoyable because you heard what good commentary should sound like and what good commentary is supposed to be. Um, what did we have? Oh, second to last match. Edge, after being gone for like a year, they tried to bring him back on Raw as a babyface. And if you remember, this really didn't work. The good thing about it, though, as even though he came in here, he had an average match at Kane, and he goes over here, and you were trying to go in this direction. You were trying to make him a babyface. You are trying to get him over that way, and it really didn't gravitate. He, you learn from this experience to the point where less than a year later, you've got the ultimate opportunist, and he's doing all of this crap, and you're off to the races with him. And Edge is one of your fortunate four, along with Batista, Orton, and Cena. Maybe that's part of the reason why this show was all right, too. It was 2004, and since it was a Raw SmackDown split, there was no Cena! Even though at this time, he wasn't in the World Championship picture. I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, but the other match that mattered, the main event. A repeat of WrestleMania, the triple threat for the World Heavyweight Championship. Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Chris Benoit. I gotta be honest, it's tough going back and watching this match. I was a huge... Benoit fan. I was a fan of the Wolverine. You know, when he would lock in that crippler cross face, I would mark out. And then especially on the heels of, with this show, what happened at WrestleMania 20, after all of those years, it's finally come true. It's Madison Square Garden. His best friend in life, Eddie Guerrero, retained his WWE championship early in the night against Kurt Angle. Benoit makes God tap of all people in the garden at Mania in the main event. And then you've got Eddie and you've got Benoit. And unfortunately, all that never happened now. And unfortunately, you can't remember that with fond memories. You just can't. Because you know what ended up becoming of everything and you know how the situation played out 
It was really awkward as this match was playing out, especially in Chris's home area and everything. Is you would see the pictures of women, woman, you would see his older son, you would see the younger son, and you know a couple of years later what all went down. So it really, honestly, unfortunately, ruins the enjoyment of the match where at random points in time, they flash to Chris Benoit's wife and you're like, oh, he allegedly killed her. He probably killed her. He probably choked out his son and his son forgot to tap. Now, the match itself was exactly what you would expect out of these three guys. It was outstanding. And in particular, once the Canadian crowd realized that Shawn Michaels was one of the three people in the match, and they're like, oh, wait, I hate you. Fuck you. We think you screwed Brett. Then to sit there and have the ref bump and have Earl Hebner come out, and there's Shawn Michaels, and he's trying to put Benoit in the sharpshooter. It was this type of small detail that takes a match to a whole different level. And this is the genius of Vince back in the day, the genius of somebody like Shawn Michaels piecing a match together, knowing that this was the perfect type of spot that you should do in this type of situation at this time. Just takes it to a whole different level because everybody could connect with that. There is fucking Shawn. He screwed Brett. There's fucking Earl Hebner. He's the one that rang the bell. He screwed Brett too. They're trying to screw Benoit. It's so simple. It's fucking genius. Not everything in professional wrestling has to be rocket science. Usually, most of it isn't. But if it makes sense and people can relate to it and they can connect to it, man, it could really be awesome. And the one thing I can't take away at the time <clears throat> was that after almost two decades in the business, Chris Benoit finally getting the World Heavyweight Championship, in WWE at least, was a massive moment. Because it was one of those things you're like, the WWE's never going to put the strap on him. The WWE's never going to follow through. The never WWE's not going to go all the way with him. And they most certainly aren't going to have him submit God at WrestleMania. And then the next month, the backlash in the Breakfast Club rotation, Hunter turns to Sean and says, your turn, Ugga. And Sean goes out there and gleefully taps himself. In back-to-back pay-per-views, he tapped out Triple H and then Shawn Michaels. I find that funny. Hunter's like, I did it at the big show. I'm not doing this shit again. (laughs) But how much it meant for a guy like Benoit to hold the strap. How much it meant for him to be in the same ring as guys like Triple H and Shawn Michaels and knowing what type of esteem the powers that be, the political players in WWE held those two guys and for them to be putting over Benoit in the way that they did was like a nod of the, a tip of the cap and saying, you're one of us. You're one of those guys. And of course, unfortunately, as great as this match was, it's like it never happened. And all the warm, fuzzy feelings this show, this match gave me 13 years ago, I have none of them now because that has been forever ruined. Fuck Chris Benoit. I hope he rots in hell for what he did to his family and for how much he fucked up so many of our wrestling memories over the years. It's unfortunate. It's sad. But the beat goes on. Art imitating life. <laughs>